This is part three of the chapter 15, which deals with collective behavior and social movements. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off. So the end of part two uh, was discussing the scope of responses and micro level, uh, mid range level, and then mac macro level. And when discussing macro level responses, the concept of social movements, national social movements, was introduced. So just a reminder that a social movement is a large number of people that come together in a sustained organized effort to bring about or in some cases resist social change. Usually people are coming together in this way because they lack access to political power so they aren't elected official elected officials or policy makers so they are utilizing um, kind of the strength of numbers and publicity and visibility as a way to influence those who do have access to political power um, to align with their cause and so we're going to go into more details about you know what is a social movement um, you know what are the steps of having a successful social social movement and why are some social movements more or less successful than others so first of all you know just in terms of what are the components of a social movement um, there are a lot of different ways that people can kind of organize their social movement um, protests uh, which are typically the most visible activity um, involve individuals or groups you know making demands um, and they make these demands um, usually um, by engaging in uh, civil disobedience um, where they break laws in order to make a point or in some cases you know by engaging in a boycott um, where they refrain from doing something or purchasing something or supporting something or someone um, all of which uh, as a way to kind of get the powers to be to address the demands that they are making. Um, before we get to, you know, this this part of a social movement, you know, the actual protests, the boycotts, uh, what a lot of people don't necessarily realize is there is a lot that kind of goes on, you know, behind the scenes um, that, that, that people are not necessarily aware of, um, you know, kind of beginning with, you know, who is actually participating in social movements. Um, there are is one distinction we can make between what we call beneficiary constituents uh, and conscience constituents. Um, beneficiary constituents are people who benefit directly um, from whatever the point of of the movement uh, is. So if you're thinking about something like the Dreamers um, and kind of the movement around that, and these are the children um, that were brought here um, by their parents. Um, uh, and lack documentation um, and therefore are not American citizens um, and don't really have a pathway to citizenship currently. Um, in that movement, the dreamers themselves are the beneficiary constituents. They're the people who would benefit directly, uh, you know, if Congress or the president um, was to kind of address uh, their cause um, and, you know, provide them a pathway to citizenship. Conscience constituents are people who just care about the cause. Um, these would be people that are citizens or, you know, have documentation, are, are, um, are documented immigrants um, but who nevertheless kind of align themselves with the dreamers so in almost all social movements there are beneficiary constituents and conscious constituents uh, historic examples of course you know the civil rights movement um, you know African Americans uh, in the south were the beneficiary constituents um, but uh, certainly the people who took part um, that didn't fall in that demographic uh, particularly um, whites uh, and others who came from outside of the South um, to exist with the Civil Rights Movement, they would be um, examples of conscience constituents. Um, and in both the beneficiary and the conscience constituents uh, cases, um, you know, they both can be very heavily involved, you know, uh, behind the scenes, um, as well as being very visible members of the movement itself.
So, you know, especially for maybe the conscience constituents, you know, the question is, you know, why did they get involved? You know, um, why do they have this interest or this passion about a cause that maybe doesn't directly impact them? Um, we don't necessarily know all the reasons uh, or motivating factors that would contribute to someone becoming involved in a social movement. Um, we do know that activism is more likely if a person has had prior contact with movements, if they are embedded in social networks that support movements, um, if they have personal or family history of activism, uh, if they lack practical constraints, meaning, you know, time and, 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 and money are less of a, of a constraint um, than it might be, would be for others. Um, and that if they sense if they have a sense of moral rightness right if they really feel like that this is a an important moral uh decision or you know if not engaging in the movement um is a it reveals something about their moral character for beneficiary constituents um, we know that one uh, factor is if they come to identify with others similarly afflicted. So if they start to see themselves as being um, as part of a group um, that's experiencing um, some, you know, discrimination or oppression, if they see themselves and identify themselves as being a member of that group um, and they take on that identity um, and that identity is significant to them, then that would uh, certainly contribute to their participation. Now, not everyone who benefits participates, and we call that the free rider problem, um, that there are people who avoid the cost of activism, the time, the energy, and resources, and, you know, they still benefit from its success. Um, that is just kind of an, an inherent quality of social movements, um, that if you are fighting for uh, specific rights or specific conditions, you aren't just fighting for them, um, for the people who are fighting alongside with you, you're fighting for those rights for, you know, the entire group or the entire population or all of society even. Um, and that means that there will be some people that if your movement is successful, um, definitely benefit from your movement, even if they themselves uh, did very little or did nothing at all uh, to contribute. So if you want to have this successful uh, social movement, you know, kind of what are the steps involved? Uh, you know, first you identify an issue. Um, you, this goes back to our discussions about, you know, is this a social problem or not? Um, not all uh, issues that underlie social movements rise to the level of being a full-blown social problem. But at the very least, this does need to be something that, somebody besides just you cares about um, it, it does need to move you know be beyond kind of the definition of what meals would call a trouble um, you know and at the very least uh, you know be in a social issue um, something that impacts more than just you um, and it is happening kind of on a larger like social scale and then you need to form a group um, in that group, you need to make sure that you have beneficiary and conscious constituents. And this can be particularly important um, if it's a group where most of the people involved or most of the people heavily involved are conscious constituents. Um, but not beneficiary constituents and and that's because uh this can lead to some really poor optics um and and dynamics where it looks like outsiders are telling people you know what's best for them or you know they are coming into a community that they may not necessarily be part of um and and kind of taking it over you know if you really want to make it seem like that this is a legitimate issue that needs to be addressed making sure that the people who are directly impacted by the issue are involved is key um, and sometimes this means that you might have to work a little bit harder to recruit those people um, especially if they do have constraints um, that prevent them from being uh, activists. Um, maybe they don't have a history with activism. Maybe uh, they're short on time or, or, or resources. After you form your group, you need to create a strategy. Um, so, you know, 
kind of like what we discussed when we talked about being a definer of the problem. Um, you know, you need to do some careful research. You need to be very knowledgeable about uh, your problem, um, your issue, and, and all the kind of underlying factors or contributors to that. You need to identify solutions um, in the same way that, you know, we don't address, we don't call something a problem if there isn't a solution. If, you know, if you don't think there is a solution to your issue, it doesn't make sense to really have a social movement uh, around it. You know, it's not about just raising awareness so much as it is about, you know, really trying to change, uh, create social change. And to create social change, that means that there is a, a, a solution available. Um, and then you identify power holders who in your community, your state, you know, the national government, you know, who do you need to get the attention of? Like, you know, is this a corporate issue? In which case, you know, who's the CEO? Who, who wills the power there? Um, is it a political issue? In which case you need to get the attention and interest of, you know, kind of the political powers to be. But all of these are things that you need to do in order to create a strategy. Um, and although there are some just kind of spontaneous social movements, spontaneous uprisings, uh, these most successful social movements are those that have some type of underlying strategy. And so then you have step four, um, which is mobilize resources. Um, your constituents are your most powerful resource. Um, the people People support, public support um, for your movement is what's going to gain you the most uh, mobility. Um, and so sometimes that means that you might need to increase people's awareness um, and make them uh, more knowledgeable about your issue. Uh, during the women's movement, they call this consciousness raising, um, that, you know, making this was women's rights was something that wasn't really being discussed at that time. Um, so kind of pointing out the ways in which um, women were uh, not treated equally at that time um, and, and being strategic about how you presented that information. And the role of like, you know, magazines or zines, uh, music, um, obviously today, social media, all of that is what you need to kind of get people to become aware and hopefully impassioned um, supporters of your movement. Um, then step five, you organize your actions. So this is where you decide exactly, and, and this should have come out of the strategy, how are you how how is your movement going to be organized is it going to rely on you know specific boycotts are are you going to have people you know engaging in some hashtag activism where they're utilizing social media and specific hashtags in order to increase awareness or um or to kind of uh, pressure a uh, corporate or political uh, response uh, are you going to take to the streets and engage in actual you know protest marches and rallies um, so, and, and so step number five, it might be a ongoing step depending on, you know, the scope of your movement. The civil rights movement didn't have one march. They didn't have one speech. They didn't have one boycott. Most successful movements have multiple actions spread out over a time period across different, uh, places. And then finally, number six, I, <laughs> I don't know why I have two fives there. Um, number six is, you know, if your movement is successful, you do gain power um, and success and power is needed in order to be successful in order to get your solutions um, in place whether they are corporate based solutions or political based solutions you're going to have to 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 gain power um, and that is how we measure success in the world of social movements is did you solve the problem did 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 you did you get a solution for your issue? Um, and so in order to have that solution and, and to be successful, you have to gain some type of access to power, whether that is, you know, being invited, you know, to speak uh, to Congress, whether it's getting a specific policy adopted, whether it's having a corporation drop a policy or stop a product, all of that uh, represents, um, you know, you gaining access to the powers to be um, and pressuring them to adopt one of your solutions.
but certainly not all social movements are successful um, and they can fail for a multitude of reasons. Um, kind of the most common reason for social movement failure is really just organizational and mobilization issues. Uh, you know, you have issues mobilizing your constituents, you have issues, you know, organizing a unified strategy and carrying out activities. Um, when those types of problems happen, um, it really just uh, makes the success of your movement much less likely. In some cases, the reason why your movement is, is not successful is because it's repressed. It's repressed by powerful institutions or people. Um, you know, uh, y y your Twitter page, Instagram account is shut down. Um, you aren't granted, uh, you know, permits to have your rally or your march. Um, or your rally or march is kind of shut down by the army or police. Um, you know... Not that this has not ever happened in America, because it has. Um, there are examples from both, you know, past and present that we can think of. But certainly one great thing about living in our country is we do have some specific civil liberties and freedoms um, that, you know, that protect, you know, our rights to gather and protects our freedom of speech from persecution by the government. Um, and so this means that uh, this isn't as much of a factor in social movement failure in this country as it is maybe in some other countries. Um, and the kind of final thing co-optation by movement leaders. Um, if you keep in mind that the sixth step of a successful movement is that you gain access to power or you become powerful yourself, then it makes sense. Um, sometimes the way that the system addresses your movement is they adopt some of your policies if not all of them, or they convince leaders of your movement that they would be better served by working with the system as opposed to against the system. Um, and this can really, um, this can really cause a, a movement to kind of die out. Um, it, it can kind of defeat a movement if, if the leaders kind of become part of the system or if um, some of the ideals or, the, or, or some of uh, the uh, solutions are adopted or partially adopted. Uh, it, can, it can muddy the message and, and it can lead to, um, you know, people becoming uh, less passionate and less likely to participate in the movement um, and, and, and in that case then your movement is no more. So this is the end of the material um, but certainly you know the assignment um, the writing assignment um, for this section um, you know, really encourages you to think about um, what issues you're interested in, uh, you know, how likely are you to get involved. Um, if you aren't likely to get involved, you know, being honest about, you know, why you might care about something but not have any interest in, you know, participating um, towards trying to be involved in, in getting, in, in creating social change. You know, we all vary in our levels of commitment and engagement around these issues. Um, but as this, uh, as this chapter discussed, as this course, uh, this course module discussed, um, certainly a key part of sociology um, is kind of that relationship between analysis and reform um, and the idea that we study the world in order to be uh, more knowledgeable about how to potentially change it for the better.